Hey everyone, welcome to the Just Get Hired podcast, the podcast that is your gateway to a thriving career and a strategic resource for businesses navigating the ever-evolving world of hiring. Now let's talk some real talk. Companies love to complain about turnover cost, but honestly, they're not always looking at their current team the way that they should. So re-recruiting your own employees. Have you guys ever heard about that? Not many companies focus on that and they just talk the talk. Now, turnover is hitting U.S. businesses really hard and it costs them trillions of dollars annually. And yet they still don't know how to have the right conversations. We keep throwing big bucks at finding and hiring the right people. But when it comes to keeping them, we kind of suck at it. Well, before we jump into this conversation, I want you to remember to hit that subscribe button and follow on social media if you like this conversation. If you're a seasoned professional charting your career path or your business, looking to understand the latest hiring trends while you've come to the right place, I'm your host, Jessica Fiesta George, and here's the deal. We're digging into this overlooked gem of a concept about re-recruiting your own employees. But before we dive in, I want to welcome in Randy Roberts. She's an executive and career life coach who spent 30 years in the corporate world and jumped off to do her own thing. Randy, welcome to the Just Get Hired podcast. Thanks for having me, Jess. I'm glad to be with you. Well, from your gig as an executive and career life coach, how do you see this whole re-recruiting thing playing out in the real world? Um, any game-changing strategies for companies who want to step up the game? I think it's a really critical issue because not only, to your point, are there huge costs for bringing new people into the organization, but the truth is if you can create a situation where the people that are on board now are really lit up, not only are they never going to want to leave, but the benefits go beyond that because they will bring their best. They will be more productive. They'll be more loyal. They'll look for new opportunities. They'll do all the things you want your folks to do if you create that environment for them to tap into. So, I mean, the opportunities are significant. And I think, you know, to your question about are there tips, I think it has to start with a philosophy of believing in this and taking it seriously. Because there are a couple of tips people could do to try and get people to stay if it's, you know, uh, casual dress Friday was an old one for a while. You right. know, uh, remote working arrangements, all of those things. But a lot of those things are really short term. Right. And you may do one thing and really believe another thing. So I think that philosophy of understanding why this benefits your P&L is really where it has to start. So, I I mean, why why do we bother with retention? I mean, obviously it costs a lot of money. Companies tout the fact that they are doing everything they can to retain their top employees, but I really don't think that they do a good job at it. I guess in your career and in your coaching business, why should this concept of companies re-recruiting their current employees should be a big deal. Well, I mean, you know, look, uh, yes, I'm an executive and career life coach, and that really goes to helping people achieve their career goals, be the best leaders they can. But I went to business school and I was in the business world for 30 years, to, as you mentioned. I look at everything through an element of the p and and I absolutely believe and have seen many, many examples that this re-recruiting is good for your business. It really will reduce your expenses, but it also increases the top line through increased productivity. And then there's the issue of, don't we all want to work somewhere where people are excited and people are looking to stay and looking for ways to contribute to a higher level rather than looking for ways to get out? You know, And we forget that even the people that are thinking about how do I keep my talent? Is it worth re-recruiting? There are people that are worth retaining too. Oh, absolutely. And you may be putting it into action, but you also want to feel it yourself. So the benefits are tremendous. Well, I think a lot of people have this misconception that people leave for 50 cents if you're an hourly worker to go work across the street. People will leave for like $10,000 more, but some people will leave for less because the culture is horrible, right? Or people, you always hear that term, people leave uh, terrible bosses all the time. Um, but I guess, you know, besides the financial impact of 
having to replace an employee, what would you say is like the real value in the long run? Well, it depends on the kind of business. So it has different um, implications, but the, the end result is the sustainability. You know, you lose so much in having to train new people and bring new people on board to your systems and your ways of doing things. And think about if you're in any kind of a customer facing role, the cost of replacing people is huge because you lose that relationship. That may be the moment that a customer decides to try out somebody new. I've got to work with a new team, a new point of contact anyway. I might want to see what else is out there. So the implications are are short term and they're long term. Um, and it goes to your reputation for your company Absolutely. as well. If there's a lot of turnover, I mean, I hear this all the time. If people are considering joining another company, but they see that there's a lot of turnover, they ask a lot of questions that they wouldn't have if they saw a lot of longevity. So the, the implications are everywhere. Absolutely. When people join organizations, everyone's so excited to have them on board. Obviously, they were a good hire from the beginning or you wouldn't have hired them, right? But through time, lose the fact that sometimes managers, especially of managers of big teams, um, they fail to build those relationships with those employees. And that's kind of where some of this turnover is happening, right? I mean, yeah. a lot of people don't even know their managers. They've met them on day one. Maybe it's a big organization. They get busy. They don't have a lot of interaction. So those are the types of people who start falling off and um, are thinking, how can I provide value here? Nobody even really knows. My boss doesn't really even know me. So as a manager, I feel like building teams and relationships you know, on your team are very important. Um, so when we're thinking of re-recruiting, how should we put those like high performers on the list? And do we even look and entertain some of those low performers and try to do the things to retain them? Yeah. Well, I think it's a really good question because you can't do this for everybody. And the truth is you don't want to necessarily, unless you are in a very unusual situation, you will have a segment at the bottom of performers that your overall talent, uh, your skill level would be brought up if they left and were replaced. So right. there's some that you want to, you know, not only do you not want to retain, but you may want to manage out. And I think your question really goes to focusing the effort in the areas that will have the biggest impact. And that mm -hmm. definitely is your top performers. I mean, you're so right about something you said before, which is people will leave bad bosses. People will also leave maybe more slowly, but if they sense that their boss isn't engaged in them, even mm. if they're a good boss. So it doesn't take that much effort to invest in people. And I think, you know, what your, my thoughts go to in your comments, a, a very strategic approach mm -hmm. in maybe breaking your folks down into if it's 20% buckets or, you know, 25% buckets and really um, investing a lot of your time and energy to retaining the top and maybe the second group as well. Um, because if my theory is right and what I have seen holds true across the board, that people will not only stay, but will be higher producers, will bring mm -hmm. more, will, you know, have more spark, bring new ideas. If that's true, the productivity that you, you know, the, the benefits that you will see from that effort towards the top are huge. Um, so, right. you know, I propose it doesn't take a whole lot to re-engage people and for people to sense that you are engaged with them and that you see the importance of them to the organization. You've, you know, if you're breaking people down into those levels, you obviously mm -hmm. do recognize the contributions of some of them. So the next sure. step to tell them that is not that big a leap. A lot of people need that personal touch when it comes to like engaging in their employees. And I mean, how would you suggest leaders can make that interaction and relationship building personal? So it doesn't feel like it's like you're showing up for a performance review and we're going to talk to you about your performance or give you all these accolades if you're a high performer, but how can they have genuine connection with the team? Any suggestions? Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, you know, Show up with the intention to do that, to get to know them and get to know what motivates them and ask them. It could be as easy. You're, you're absolutely right. It, it's not a performance appraisal. It's 
often a separate conversation. It might be if you're in an office, take them for a cup of coffee and just have a casual conversation and ask them what's important, the money more important or the recognition more important. Like you want to get an idea of what makes people tick so that you can create that for them. Now you may not be able to create that for them, but sometimes what you learn is, no, nope, a person just wants to be recognized for their work. And so it may be as easy as, Sending an email out to the team, recognizing what someone did, that makes them feel great. That gives the others incentive to get on that list. And if you can provide some specific examples of why what they did was so great, others can pattern after it. So, you know, in that example, what would that be? 15 minutes to yeah. ask the question, to send the email and think about what the ripples in that pond could be. So. I really think you start simple, start by getting to know someone and asking them what's important to them. And then it's okay for them. They may share things that are important to them at work. Okay. Then we stay on that level. They may also share personal things about, mm -hmm. um, you know, their alumni association that they're involved in or something that's going on with their kids. And that gives you an opening to, to know that about them, but also to step into that personal world in the right ways which is hard to do unless you're invited right. in, but it's amazing what can happen if you ask those questions. And then I would say too, it's, it's really good idea to share with them what's important to you. You know, That's if true. it's yeah. as a boss, it was always really important to me to know that I was helping people to know that I was benefiting their careers and helping them grow in the ways that they wanted to grow. I mean, it's one of the things that led me into a coaching career is I like that so much. So sometimes by telling them what's important to you, again, it can open the door for them to get what they need. Well, earlier you said something about we used to entice people with remote work and casual Fridays. But I think since the pandemic, every day seems to be casual Friday yeah, and everyone seems sure. to be working remote. So um, yeah. now Although we have- I do see, see that changing that. I see right. some companies pulling people back into the office. And what I'm seeing is if they are flexible about it and there's some sort of hybrid working arrangement or there's at least room for, it's not five days back in the office. There are a couple of companies that I work with that are uh -huh. expecting people to come back five days and they're having trouble with retention and recruitment as a result because people want some flexibility. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the trend now is, you know, it was definitely work from home, but now to your point, everyone is like craving that sense of teamwork and having people on site. Uh, so the flexible work arrangements, I think, are one of the things that we're seeing that's trending as far as retention and um, how, I, how to attract people is actually not actually having the nine to five schedule, but being able to flex in and flex out as needed too. So if that means a four day work week, if it means like you come in and work like a 12 to seven o'clock shift because you've got stuff to do in the morning with your kids, you know, just having that flexibility of not having uh, traditional office hours. Uh, we're seeing that, but are there any other trends that you're seeing um, as well that other companies are kind of entertaining or talking about? I think those are really the big ones in terms of, you know, the, the thinking that, one size does not fit all. And so you need to know what people need to know if you can create it. And look, there are some employees that take it too far. Yes, They expect to get too much. I talked to a client this morning. She said she has this group that she's having an issue with on her, on her team. It's a call center okay. um, that expects to get 12 weeks vacation. Well, I'm sorry. You have a job. That's not realistic. So I left 12 certainly weeks vacation myself. So. Exactly. I said, you can have 12 weeks of vacation, but you can't come back. That right. was my response to it. But, you know, there, there are limits. There are certain things where an employer cannot flex. But if you understand the nature of your work and it makes sense and you can flex, why not? I mean, especially working hours like there. I used to work for global companies. There was there were many days that I had to have meetings with teams in Asia or teams in Europe. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the normal working hours didn't apply anyway. And what that goes back to is having clear expectations, having metrics for performance, having regular feedback, and then most people can be trusted to deliver. 
And, you know, why not trust that they can mm -hmm. until they prove otherwise, rather than making people trust until they prove that they're, you know, that they're trustworthy. It's just different approaches to it. But I firmly believe that if people understand the expectations and you talk about and you hold them accountable, most people will deliver. Well, I think we gave a lot of good tips for employers, but if you're an employee and you're listening to this episode and you're like, well, you know, like, I don't like my job anymore. Any tips on how maybe people can fall back in love with uh, their job again? I love that question so much because that's kind of what my work is about, is helping people love their job while they're accomplishing their goals. I really think what's important, if you're feeling less inspired than you used to, or like what used to excite you is now exhausting. I think mm -hmm. we've all gone through periods like that. Oh, yeah. It's really important to get to the bottom of it. And it requires a little bit of inner work. Try and figure out what's the problem. What's missing that you used to have, what you need now, maybe you've grown in a way that you, your job no longer stretches you. So you may have changed, the situation may have changed, but if you don't get to the bottom of what it is that you need, mm -hmm. you may go somewhere else and repeat the problem. No, you're not going to know that you're fixing the right thing. So, you know, an approach that I take, um, I actually offer a free career satisfaction assessment. It's available on my website, which is randyrobertscoaching.com, Randy with an I, under the resource section. What you what it does is it enables you to start taking a look at what might be missing. Like it's a great place to go if your question is, how do I get to the bottom of this? How do I figure out what's wrong? And what it will do, you'll take yourself through um, your satisfaction level on eight different areas of fulfillment. And it may give you ideas. The places where you score lower mm -hmm. may give you some ideas of things that you need to dial into a little bit more. And there are things like company leadership, balance, growth, those kinds of things. So it's a great place to start um, to try and see what you may need. And what a lot of people find, Jess, is mm -hmm. that once they identify what the issue is, they may be able to find what they need right where they are. And for most okay. people, You'd rather not move. There are financial reasons to stay where you are very often, especially if you're with a public company and you have stock options and things like that. So, hey, if you can fix the problem right where you are, it's usually worth trying. So I offer that up as a good starting place for people. Okay. Well, I'm going to make sure we'll have the links in the show notes. I'll put them on my website as well um, to make sure that people can find that. That's a great tool to have. I might need to take that myself, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's so many things. I mean, we, like I mentioned earlier, we were great employees when you get hired, you know, you're excited, you're passionate about the work that you do. And then through time, things happen. And then you kind of fall out of love for the, the work that you're doing. So how do you like boost up what you already have because then to your point you have to start over again if you go somewhere else and have to reestablish who you are you got to have another manager to try to show them what you you've got um so there's a yeah. lot of work that you also have to do that people don't really think about when they leave a job so um yeah. you know great stuff there and I'm going to make sure we'll have that for all of our listeners. Uh, but before we go, I mean, I want to talk about your uh, coaching business really quick. Um, you got into it after being in corporate America for uh, almost 30 years. You want to just talk about your coaching business really quick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my focus, as you mentioned, executive and career life coach. And so I work with clients one-on-one -on -one, really in sort of two, two buckets of work. One is if executives are um, having some, uh, there's some things that they need to work on to overcome barriers to get to that next level. Also, if they've just taken on a new level of responsibility, it's an important time to have the support you need around you. I found that in my own career. So love working with people there. And the other thing that I tend to work on is around the spirit of helping people love their work while they're achieving their goals mm -hmm. um, and really make sure that the work that you're doing is fitting who you are at this point in your life. So absolutely love that. And if I could put in a quick plug um, for my own podcast. and Yes, YouTube I was going to say that. <laughs> thank you. That is another resource that people may find helpful. And that is called Fulfilling Career. Happy life. Love it. Happy life. 
as they say, happy wife, but you know, depending on how you, who, who you were talking to, but that's awesome. I'm, I forgot we're, we're both fellow podcasters. So I'm glad you plugged that in. Well, Randy, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show. I, appreciate all of your wisdom today. I think the resources that you have on your website are going to be a great tool for anybody who's listening. So we'll have that um, available for them. So if you're a seasoned professional and you're navigating the hiring landscape, listen to Randy's uh, podcast and stay tuned here to the Just Get Hired podcast as your go-to resources. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this conversation and you want more career insights and hiring strategies, make sure that you subscribe to both both of our podcasts. Follow us on social media. Share this episode with your network because your support helps us to continue to bring you guys valuable content. And hey, if you have a burning career question, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about how to hire better, or if you're just struggling with your job search, drop us a line on social media or on our websites because we would definitely love to hear from you guys. So thank you guys for tuning in. Until next time, keep thriving on your careers, navigating those hiring waters like a pro. My name is Jessica Fiesta George, your host of the Just Get Hired podcast. What do y'all want to talk about next? I'll catch you on my next episode.